8 says this, Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to him, what are you seeking? And they said to him, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? So as Jesus sees them following, he asks them a question. What we see here is the first red letters in the Gospel of John. Red letters, as you guys know, if you've been around here, this is where Jesus is speaking. And the first words that John records is this question, what are you seeking to these two disciples? Not who are you seeking or why are you seeking, but what are you seeking? In essence, he's saying, what do you want? He sees these two guys, he just turns to them and says, hey, what do you guys want? And that's a great question for all of us in here this morning, isn't it? Think about it. What are you seeking this morning as you walk through those doors? What do you want this morning as you sit here and you come to the crossing? What compelled you to come here? What are you seeking? Are you seeking to have, again, grow in your depth and relationship with Christ? And you're seeking, hey, we're called to come together as a large group on Sundays to to lift up Jesus through song and through prayer, through the teaching of the word and through fellowship. Is that what you're seeking? Just to continue to grow, which I know many of you are. That's awesome. You know, maybe some of you come in here and you're, you're lonely. And you're seeking uh, companionship, but you're seeking a community. You've tried what the world says, come and see and taste what is good, and it's not, it's not doing it for you. So you come in here lonely and you're, and you're looking for friendship. That's good. That's noble. We're glad you're here. Or, or maybe you come in here and you're just checking the box, right? You're doing the religious activity of the day. You know, the, the, the church that's going on Sundays is just one of those things you add on to your life to hope that when God, when you stand before the Lord, he's like, oh, you checked that box, you went to church on Sunday, January 22nd, awesome, great, come on in. Maybe, maybe that's what you're doing. Or maybe some of you, especially you single people in here, you're looking for a husband or you're looking for a wife, right? And that's awesome. We're, you know, you, you, you can go out there and find her. You can come here. That's a noble gift. We're, we're not going to knock that. We encourage that here. But it's a good question for us as we come here. What are you seeking this morning? What do you want? This is the question that Jesus asked the disciples. And what's interesting is they answer his question with what? A question. Now, I don't know about you, but when I ask someone a question, I do not want another question back at me, right? I mean, does that frustrate anyone else in here? Hey, what are you seeking? Uh, Where are you staying? Uh... You know, you can almost see this turn into an episode of Seinfeld at some level, right? But Jesus knows their answer. He's patient. The Holy Spirit is working through him because they really are answering his question, even though it's a question. When the question they give is, where are you standing? Uh, Where are you staying? What it means is these guys are saying, hey, we want to be with you. We want to follow you. Our desire is, yeah, we believe you're the Lamb of God, and there's no other place that we want to be. We want to be with you. And and actually, that's what Jesus understands them to saying, and it's actually kind of a weird and odd response. Because basically what these guys are doing is they're inviting themselves over to Jesus' house and in his life. You know, it's like when, you know, that person who wants to hang with you, you know, I've had people come up to me and be like, uh, hey, Aaron, um, hey, what are you doing this afternoon? I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know. He goes, how about I come over and you feed me lunch and and you feed me dinner and um, we talk about life. I mean, it's kind of an odd question, right? You're like, oh, that's kind of weird, stalker. You know, you're like, oh, whoa. And so, but Jesus doesn't think that right here. That's not his response to them. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, um, yeah, that would be great, but I'm starting a new movement here, and you guys are just fishermen, and you're not what I'm looking for. You, you don't have the gusto. I'm looking for the who's who in this world, and it's not you guys. So all you guys need to do is believe in me that I'm the Lamb of God, repent of your sin, and you'll be good. Just take that message. He doesn't do that either. What does he do? He doesn't, again, give a sermon. He doesn't give them a bunch of information. But what does he do? He gives them an invitation. He gives them an invitation. And it's in the form of this, verse 39. He said to them, come and you will see. Come and see. I invite you into my life. I want you around. And this, as we will see throughout the Gospel of John and even the next coming verses, is the way that Jesus disciples his disciples. This is his method of discipleship. He does it through living life with them. He does it through life on life. And we'll see that over the next, well, 
It was about three years that he walked with his disciples. We'll see that over the next, as we cover the Gospel of John. Not only does he give them information, because he will give them information, he'll talk about the Bible, he'll talk about the scriptures, but he does it in such a way that it lines up with his life. Discipleship happens both word and deed. Come and you will see. And this is one of the most fruitful and impactful ways to bring people to Jesus and to disciple them. In fact, it is the most impactful way to give them an invitation and not just information. And I could give you a number of stories of how that worked out. I've been in ministry for a long time. I've been a Christian for over 20 plus years. And, and by God's grace, um, he's used uh, our family in ministry and outside of ministry to do this. But I want to give you how this works out. What does this come and see? How does it look in a person's life with my favorite disciple of all time, my wife Rita? We're going to take you back a little bit, 20 plus years, 27 to be exact, 1990, right? Is that 27 years ago? I think so. All right. So Reed and I met uh, in college, our very first college class. I came to know the Lord just a couple months before that as a senior in high school. And when I met Rita, she was not a Christian. She was not a believer. She had a, little, a much different background and history of growing up than I did. Uh, my family uh, came to know the Lord through a number of events and... Um, um, Rita did not have that same background. So the first time that she ever heard the gospel was at our house on a uh, Thanksgiving and through, uh, through myself and through our family. So 18 plus years, she never heard the gospel until then. So, so she came to our house and, and she met our family throughout the years. And, and she said, man, the only reason why, she didn't say this to me, but in her mind, she's like, the only reason why you guys believe, Aaron, is because you've never had any problems in your family. It's been smooth sailing. You've never had any issues in your family. Unlike me, she came from a, uh, her, her family or family divorce and there was some alcoholism and stuff, and she had a pretty rough go. And, and, and she thought, well, that's the only reason why you guys believe in Christ. And then, as you know, on Christmas Eve, my junior year, um, my mom went out to a party and she died on Christmas Eve. She had an allergic reaction at a, at a Christmas party, and she died on Christmas Eve. And then it was at that point where Rita saw the devastation, uh, the, the trial that, the, probably one of the bigger trials that I've ever gone through, walk. And, and she got to see that even though we were devastated, even though that we were, you know, hurting and had pain, we also had this peace and this joy because my mom knew Jesus. And she saw this emo- both these emotions through me. And she, what she saw was that that event, that circumstance that was so tough didn't push us away from Jesus, but she saw it even make us more and more dependent on Jesus and his word. She saw that even though in this devastation that we were rejoicing, we were actually celebrating because we knew my mom, she died of you know, a- allergy, asthma. Um, she was in heaven and she didn't want to come back. She also saw that um, when we talked about this, that it, it was, yes, it was a loss, but I always use this phrase in talking to people, even back then, it's like um, the little boy was at a funeral and they were saying, man, sorry about your loss, man, sorry about your loss. And the little boy said, hey, something's not lost if you know where it is. We knew that my mom was in heaven So there was joy there. So she got to see all this and experience this, not only the the word, but she also got us to see it lived out in our lives, that Jesus was our rock. And from her observing this, this is the thing of the faith working in our family that brought Rita to a turning point towards her life with Christ. She saw that the thing that upheld us was God's word, was Christ, was the community around us, and that she didn't have anything like that if something like that happened to her. And that drove her to Christ, and she realized the only person that could give her that strength, that peace, that comfort, that joy in such a brutal circumstance was Christ. So the Lord used that. See, the point is my, uh, the Lord used my family and I to invite Rita into our lives to come and see, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Even in the most, some of the most dire circumstance. And by God's grace, he used that to start to change her life. And for the past 26 years, Reed and I have been sharpening one another through this come and see. We have been growing in Christ and into his image through the daily grinds and the daily joys of living in a Genesis 3 world. And ever since then, we've been, we didn't keep it to ourselves, but we kept inviting others, come and see, come and see and experience this Jesus. 
So who in your life, who in your life have you invited in to come and see and experience Jesus recently? Or maybe is there someone in your life right now? Maybe it's somewhere where you work or it's a family member or it's a friend. Who in there that maybe someone has put in your path that you need to invite in just like Jesus? Hey, what are you seeking? Hey, come and see. Come and see and experience Jesus. You see, this has been the foundation of the crossing, as I I said, since 2009, and it will continue to be the foundation of the crossing in 2017, that we want to have people experience Jesus through our lives, both the highs and the lows, through the valleys and on the green pastures, so we can now show how Jesus is sufficient for everyone.